what are we doing here? Um, and uh, you do a, a number of meditation sessions. What, what is it for? What is it for? Uh, a number of you had uh, mentioned either in your application or in the opening sharing, saying that um, you know meditation is good, but it's hard for you to get into it, to get um, a regular practice going. It's a very common uh, problem. And um, I believe one of the most important reasons, um, many people like, like to think that it's because they don't have enough time. Uh, I would call them more of an excuse. Uh, that's the symptom. Uh, you just can't find time to do that. Um, I b believe the more uh, deep-seated reasons that we don't, we're not convinced that we need it. We're not convinced of its importance. When we don't think something is important, then we just can't find the time to do it. Like, do you have trouble finding time to eat? A couple of days after you don't eat, you say, yeah, I really need to find time to eat. Right? It's getting really critical now. All right. But um, because you haven't been convinced <coughs> that you really need to practice, that's why you haven't made it a, a priority. So that's been my um, own observation. And you can see <coughs> if that is the case with you. Um, the reason why we haven't been able to see its importance may be because we don't really know why we are practicing. It can get a little bit um, lost after a while. <coughs> In the beginning, maybe some time ago, we start go we go some go to some meditation class. We watch on TV. Oh, like mindfulness is good, you know. I heard it's on Oprah nowadays, so it must be you know <laughs> something useful. And uh, we maybe we had a friend who did that, and whatever reason that brought us to meditation, and we, we did it, and we remember it was a good experience, and we did a little bit, and we forget to do it for some time. Can't quite remember, sort of all a blur. And um, some of us might have done it consistently, but may still be possible that after a while we'll forget what we're doing. And so it's always helpful for us to take a little bit of time to think about what we're doing here. And um, a lot of people will talk about, oh yeah, I want to meditate, meditate because I want to relax. So I want to relax. And many people really like the feeling Oh, okay, so relaxed, so calm, and I really like that. And it's like a sort of a, a really like a spa session. You know, you go like get okay, massage, oh, so nice. And so you because you like that feeling so much, that's why you do it. And then so like once you you're off the cushion, oh, like you know, life is horrible again. And then so really, you come to uh, meditation for this sort of comfortable, um, pleasant sensation. Um, nothing wrong with that except that after a while you might think, well, first of all, not every time you sit on a cushion you get that sensation. There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee you sit your butt on the cushion, you're going to feel calm. Because that day your mind may be reeling and you'll be like, one day, okay, maybe next time I will have that nice, calm, relaxing sensation that I'm here for. Second time, third time, fourth time is not happening. Then you'd be like, well, like, I may as well go get a massage. That's a full guarantee. I pay you know, 100 bucks, I get the relaxation sensation. That's what I'm looking for. After a while, we just feel, why bother? Some people, if you are just looking for that pleasant sensation, that little calm, it's like you pay money to get a little pleasant experience and we find that it's not even guaranteed then you might you can find other ways to experience that it's easy to fall into that because you might have a very uh, pleasant calm relaxing sitting session and the mind may grasp onto that thinking oh that's what this is for this feels so good oh okay i know what meditation is for just for this okay I know, I got it. And you got the wrong thing. So you might want to investigate to see if that's what it is. And related to that is some people 
They come to a meditation to uh, escape from reality. Like, oh, like he's in here, and like, I don't want to think about anything. I just focus on my breath. But that's, and then if you've done that, it's like, oh, like all the things that bother me, they're not there for that 15, 30 minutes. That's good. And some people, they do it at the retreat. They come to retreat to escape from their life. So see if you are doing that. And some people, after a while, like if they have that uh, subtle intention in their mind, after a while, they're like, oh, this is kind of a lot of hard work to escape. Like, there are much easier ways to escape, right? Television, alcohol, you name it. There's no shortage of that in our culture. Why do this painful cross like thing to escape? Yeah. So if that's what we're looking for, uh, after a while, we might like, Oh, that, that, that doesn't seem worth it. You have other ways to achieve that goal. So ask yourself what you are looking for. And so you might ask, well, what is the purpose of the practice? Why do we do what we do? And it's an important question to ask, uh, especially when we talk about practicing meditation. Many people are sort of like, oh, practice. We think about a practice as equal to sitting meditation. Now, I hope that I have made some in-row in that, <laughs> into that point that practice happens all the time, whatever you're doing. It has to do with what you do with your mind, not what you do with your body. And, uh, but um, if you have engaged in other kind of meditative practice, it is easy to get confused about what it is that you're doing. Some meditative practice focus on just making the mind blank. There are such practices. That's not what we do here, though. If you believe you're here to make your mind blank, you're absolutely at the wrong place. So, and not because we don't see, um, there might be reason for people who want to make their mind blank, but you might ask yourself, why? What will be the benefit for you to make your mind blank. Blank may be as a result of you not allowing any thought to arise. You have figured out a way to make thought not arising. Or you have uh, figured out a way to create an illusion that you are not having thoughts. I call it like creating a foggy mind. Some people find a way, making the body to feel a certain way, create a little zzz in the mind, to drown out all the, everything in the mind, and then they get this sensation that, oh yes, I'm very calm. No thoughts arising at all. I'm always very suspect when someone tells me there's no thought arising. Were you asleep? Hmm. <laughs> someone come in the interview proudly, oh, there's no thought at all. It's like, were you knocked out? <laughs> and more telling is that the belief that, oh, that's a good thing. That's what I'm achieving. Again and again, um, in the very important sutra in Chinese Chan tradition, platform sutra, Master Hui Neng warned against that, practicing to cultivate this blank mind, not, arising, not allowing any thought to arise. Yet there's no shortage of people trying, thinking that this is good practice. That's why I made it a point to mention this every single time when I lead a retreat, because this is very often the number one complaint people have when they do a sitting meditation. I thought, like, it's a problem. It is like you're complaining about being alive. Yet you have thought because you are alive. Your brain works. I'm reading this book about people who have brain damage. They can't feel their body. Would you like that? They can't hold any memory. Would you like that? We're certainly not shooting for that. What are we shooting for? What are we doing here? If any of you had heard any of Jakamundi Buddha's teaching, you may have heard of the very first thing he taught. The very first thing, the very first noble truth he talked about 
is the truth of suffering that is our human condition. It's not because it's, he didn't, he's not saying we're stuck with suffering. Don't hear that wrong. Just like, yeah, that's part of our, this, our experience. And he also talked about how we create our suffering. We create our suffering. And he talked about how, but you don't have to suffer. So it's not hardwired in your brain that you're damned to suffer as just because you're a human being. You do, but actually, you know what? There is this path. If you practice, you don't have to suffer. He's not demanding that you um, cultivate this path to stop suffering. He's offering to you. You can totally walk away and not choose this and continue to suffer for the rest of your life. You're very welcome to choose that also. But he's giving us a choice. I have mentioned that a number of times in the practice. It's always your choice. No one is telling you to do anything. If you like your suffering, you can always keep them. No one's taking them away from you. In fact, no one can. No one but yourself can transcend your suffering. So if you like to keep them, you can always keep them. And that's what we're here to do, is to cultivate uh, the path to transcend suffering. A number of you had reported in the day's practice that you have sort of a taste of that. It sounds like a very um, long path. You have to go a lifetime or a lifetime. Some of you might have read Sutra talk about you have to go into cowpers and cowpers, you know, to, for you to get to the end. But actually, this moment you can stop suffering. <coughs> and that's what we have been talking about in the day's practice. The moment you remember to bring your mind right here to be fully in this present moment, you don't suffer. Some of you have shared that experience today, in that moment. The things that have been bothering you like crazy, it's not there. I can just be here, fully here, enjoying being me, being in this moment. And the reason why we don't experience that very often is because we have cultivated lifetime of habitual tendency. These thought habits that I have alluded to a number of times today now, that we constantly criti criticizing ourselves, second guessing ourselves, believing that we are not good enough, coming up with ideas about ourselves that get in the way of us, of truly, truly just be. Some of you had also shared that experience, noticing, oh, well, I do that. And those are very valuable discoveries. Rather than dismissing them, oh, like, I guess I screwed up, I shouldn't do that. No, no. I urge you, urge you to take that experience with you. Remember, remember many number of you share in our discussion after the Art of Seeing workshop, talking about how you trip yourself up, how you came up with these ideas that keep you from being able just to be here, really here. Good, remember that. Next time you do it again, it's like, remember last time I did that? That's what happened. But when I stop doing that, I'm able to be here, to enjoy just this present moment. Those are very precious lessons. And that's why retreat the practice is so important. When we become more proficient in our practice, we are more and more able to find this moment in our daily life practice. But in the beginning, this <coughs> more simplified environment will facilitate our finding those moments where you have this clarity. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. 
you are literally seeing the first two noble truths seeing how I suffer, how I create my suffering by getting this idea in my, my mind I can't do this, oh, I have to, I have to, I better be really good at doing this and yes I can do this, but it's like me giving me pressure make it a terrible experience I can just be here enjoying doing this but we find ourselves doing that over and over again because this habit we might not even know we have this habit. Habits are like air. Fear all the time and we don't notice it. But actually it's possible to feel the air, right? When you pay attention. Same thing. It's possible for you to notice these habitual thought patterns that arise over and over and over and again. Some of you have talked about how thought after thought after thought make a chain. Loops, they play like loop recorder over and over and over again. And this is what we are doing here. We cultivate the practice. When we remember to use the method, in the moment we can truly be here, walking, eating, drawing, sitting, whatever it is. We allow ourselves to be fully present in that moment, not giving rise to our suffering. How do we give rise to suffering, you might ask? You might have this experience in your sitting. A number of you have shared that already. We sit here, and all we need to do is to sit here and just know that we're breathing. You've been breathing all your life, so you don't need to do anything special. And actually, you're totally capable of knowing things that are happening. So that's all you need to sit here, I'm breathing, and be aware of it. But the funny thing is that we create ideas. Like, okay, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm doing this thing. So that means I should be a certain way. Like maybe I should be calm. I should have no thought. I should be able to count one to ten over and over again, never fail, never get tripped up. I thought that's how I should be. So we create this idea of how we should be. And then here we're in meditation and we compare what is actually happening with that ideal picture of how we should be in a meditation. So you come up with the complaint, too many thoughts. I, do. I cannot count to one to ten consistently. I get off the method. Something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. The reason why you think something is wrong with you is that you compare yourself to some imagined, perfected version of yourself. You're all doing great. But we create our suffering. In this meditation, we find ourselves doing that, and we do that in many different ways in our daily life. I should be a better whatever. If we are artists, I should be a better artist. If I'm if an athlete, I should be able to do this better. I should be whatever. And then so we create this unsatisfactoriness about what is who we are right now. When we can only be who we are right now. Right now, of all everything we have done in the past, everything we learned, everything we chose to do, everything we chose not to do, made us the person we are now. It doesn't mean that we are stuck with being the who we are now forever. 
even if, though if you want to, you won't be. We keep changing. We keep changing. But this is what we are. Can we be at ease with this? Is the question. Some of you have shared that there were moments that you know, when you were just when you were here with your method, with your breath, going off, remember, come back. Yes, yeah, this is what it is. That's it. That's it. The trick is to remember to remember to do this. We forget more often than we remember. The moment we remember, hey man, I'm doing good. It's like, it's like, it's like, so then we off the method. We're so off the method we don't even know. And if we are not attentive, if we don't maintain this clear awareness before we know it, our habits take over. It's really kind of like um, swimming in a current. Probably many people haven't done that. Uh, I, I haven't swam in the current. I have scuba dive <laughs> in the current. It's kind of like the water is moving this direction and you are swimming that way. And our habit is like this current. It easily takes over. But they don't have to. Also, you don't have, when, when they, they, the current takes over, the habit takes over when we are not in the present, when we allow it, when we're not tempted. We're here, we're just, what's the swimming? Swimming is steadily, moment after moment, remembering to come back to the practice. The moment we remember to come back to practice, then we are allowing ourselves the clarity to see what's arising, giving us the space to choose, okay, do I want to go with that thought pattern that I've done so many times to sabotage myself? I've been down that path. Do I want to go? Like the current's going that way. The current's going that way. Or I'm just staying with the method. Keep swimming. Keep your stroke. This way we live with this in a piece that David was talking about, in the joy, the Dharma joy, regardless of the conditions in life we live in. It may be very tumultuous, very difficult, very challenging, maybe not so much, but we know what we can do. We cannot control what happened in our environment, but we certainly can control what, how we react, how we carry ourselves in this tumultuous world. It's by coming back, remembering to come back to the practice, moment after moment, walking, eating, working, whatever we're doing. And so in the practice, when we do sitting meditation, what we're doing is to really get, um, gain proficiency, like remem in remembering to come back to the method, because like David said, in sitting meditation, it is the most simplified uh, form of practice so that all we need to do is to remember to stay on the method and, when, and remember to notice that we're off the method and then remember to figure out how to come back to the method. We do it over and over and over and over again. It's like um, I play tennis when I want to practice my forehand. So, so you hit it over and over and over and over again. So you get sort of like a refinement in how you hold your racket, how you react. And you, will you make mistake? Absolutely. But you learn from your mistake. That's why every time you get knocked off your method by a very strong emotional memory, very negative thought, very vivid uh, image of a very unpleasant memory, whatever it is, great. 
that's an opportunity to practice finding our way back to the method. It is like, you know, when I have to play with someone who is much better than me. I got really beat, but, you know, I got better. Exact same thing in practice. Many people, they fear a lot of thought, fear, difficult conditions. Master Shunyan always remind us it is in adversity that we truly get to grow. So, when the conditions are good, our body's relaxed, our mind is calm, we sit and we can stay on the method, very good, very good. But when the conditions are not good, we're very drowsy, legs really hurt, mind's all over the place, we keep dwelling on a very um, negative memory, that's good too. Because, oh, now I have the opportunity to practice figuring out how to find myself back to the method. And when we are able to stabilize the mind with this method, as we, whether our condition is good, we can really sit calm, or whether the condition is not good, the condition is not good, we can still be calm. It just doesn't feel calm, but like, Moment after moment, we remember the come back method is calm. It's, that's what we're talking about, this silence. Silence does not mean there's no, nothing happening. It's like there's happening, but not a problem. Not a problem. You're not reacting. You're not fighting against it. It's okay. This total acceptance of what's happening, going with it. So, when we're able to settle down our mind, then it allows us to see what arises in our mind more clearly. That's the clarity that I've been talking about. Why do we cultivate this clarity? This clarity allows us to see into our mind. We spend very little time to know our mind. When was the last time you truly pay attention to what's arising in your mind? We don't do that. Our, our culture doesn't encourage it. Instead, it gives us all sort of distractions so that we can not look at our mind to the extent that we are afraid to be by ourselves. We sit here like, oh, it's like freak out by our own mind. It's like, because oh, I'm afraid to be alone. It's like I'm afraid what arises in our mind. We literally freak out by our own mind. It's a little sad, huh? It's like we freak out because we are unfamiliar with it. Not because, but we have this illusion that there's some demon inside. We're so used to being afraid of our minds. Like, no, it's just that we are a little unfamiliar with it. So the practice is to become familiar with our mind. Isn't it time for us to really get to know ourselves the way it truly is? Not not all those ideas about how I should be, I wish I could be, all the things I feel I fall short, all the things I wish, 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 I should, should, should. That's not what I'm talking about. You spend your lifetime doing that. That's not knowing yourself, you're just talking about other things. Maybe other people's idea of who you should be? Spend all your life worrying about that. Have you spent enough time getting to know who you actually are? Appreciating it for what it is. You may be very surprised at what you find. If you only allow yourself to do it. 
when we allow ourselves to really know ourselves, like David said, we begin to develop this compassion. It's impossible to truly love ourselves if we don't know who we really are. Who are we loving? We don't even know. We're loving like some abstract idea, some made-up, fabricated self. When we truly allow ourselves to know who we are, yes, our limitations. We acknowledge that. Our positive qualities, allowing ourselves to acknowledge that too. Yes, I'm pretty good at doing that. You know, I'm a nice person. Some people had terrible difficulty doing that. And if that's the case with you, you want to investigate that. Chances are that's causing you a lot of trouble in your life. So when we really feel we have a good sense of who we are, the positive, the limitations, this feels real. Not some dream, not some made up, fabricated idea. Yeah, I know who I am. I know. And that sense of confidence is qualitatively different from this fake confidence when we drum up some fake sense of confidence that our culture has taught us to do. We, re- we know we know. None of this is made up. It feels very solid. And when we can feel like that, then we will find that the anxiety, the insecurity will also fade. We feel the insecurity, anxiety, because we feel we don't have solid ground to stand on. Because we don't know who we are. And why does that cause anxiety? Well, we don't know who we are. We don't know how our mind operates. We find ourselves getting blindsided by it. We're here enjoying ourselves. Suddenly, boom, like you know, some negative things, like, and then we spit out something to hurt this person we really care about. Hey, where did that come from? Who's driving this car? I thought I was driving this car. Someone else was. Someone had to be remote control and took over. Well, if that's how we feel in our life most of the time, well, no wonder we are anxious. This is a little freaky, you know. Someone just take over. Well, if we don't know our mind, it feels like that all the time. These habits take over. It feels like someone's taking over your car while you're sitting in the driver's seat. You thought you're driving. You thought you're going there, but it went there. When we know our mind, we find ourselves much less likely to be blindsided. We know, oh yes, this thought pattern, this old friend comes up wanting to tell me, you're not good enough, don't even try, and then I go down the road of doing things to sabotage myself. No, this pattern is in the practice that we get to know it. And then when we can recognize it, see it coming, then we have the space to decide, do I want to allow it to take over and go down a row of sabotaging myself? Or do I want to just stop it there? Mm-hmm. Because I know you like to come, but no thank you. I'm not going to listen to you this time now. I know what to do. I have my practice. I have my method. Always your choice. And that's what the practice is for. And that is why we engage in meditation to stabilize our mind so that we can have enough clarity. In this clarity, we can begin to see how our mind reacts. And you start in your meditation, in your sitting meditation. That is the most simplified environment. 
that is the most fertile ground for you to really get to know your mind. So, pay attention. How do you react? For example, you find that you've gone off the method. You start, oh, I can't move this. I'm not, I, I guess I can't do this. You know, I just won't be able to do this. Can't, can't, can't. Criticize, criticize, criticize. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I got one. I see this pattern. Oh, that's how I. That's how I re react. React to situation, and you can ask yourself: Do I do this in my life all the time? A lot of the time, maybe. When something goes wrong, we start criticizing ourselves. Tell ourselves, "You, I'm not going to have told you. Told you, you can't do this." Whatever other story you have been telling yourself all your life. This is an example. Some people may run away, pain. Oh, like, okay, how do I run away? Okay, let me go and start this movie in my mind. They literally start a movie, right, which was the most exciting movie I've seen recently. Go start it and then play and go into that to distract us from our pain or unpleasant. Sensation, feelings, emotions. So some people always say that, oh, like in in my meditation, I just keep you know watching these movies. Yeah, because you want to. You're choosing to go to those movies. You're running away from yourself. So, oh, okay, that's what I'm doing. You get some clarity about. What you do, what mind is doing, then you can begin to figure out what it is that you would like to do. That's what we are doing here in the practice. Practice remembering to come back to the method, to the practice. And cultivate this clarity to allow us to see what we are doing to create our suffering. Some of which very subtle, and we need ever deeper clarity to see into more and more subtle level of our our mental habits. And when you see that, you literally shocked. I've seen this. Jaw dropping. People in the interview room, like, guys, like, yeah, you know. So now you see that you've been doing all your life to yourself, and no amount of other people telling you will do the same. That's why I always ask you not to just believe me. You won't anyway. You don't really believe what I say. I hope at least you will try to check it out by yourself, and that's what we are doing in the practice, allowing ourselves the opportunity to check out for yourself, for yourself what your mind's been doing, how it's causing you suffering, how when you actually remember to come back to the practice, oh wow. There's a difference. Nothing I say can convince you of that. You have to experience it yourself, and that's why we practice. So, I hope this helps clarify a little bit what we are doing here. Sorry to um, inform you, this is not a spa, and uh, so. Uh, but I want to see if there's any question. Um, so this is a time we have planned to uh, open up to the floor for you. If you any, for example, if any part of the talk confused you, or you have uh, whatever question about the practice, uh, this is a good opportunity for you to share and. Uh, When you bring up questions, 
really is an act of compassion because chances are you're not the only person who has that question. So by bringing that up, you provide us with the opportunity to discuss that. And the question is not just for me, so you can. We, we will, he, we will, we will, we will respond depending on who has something to say. So. Yeah, it shouldn't make some. Don't make some. Don't make some. If, it's a, if it's something that you had done a lot back when you had, did that practice, then it's, it, it may be natural that it just comes up because it's an association with meditation or something like that. Uh, but it but stops my mind from wandering. Uh, except your mind wandering. Okay. And <laughs> unfortunately, like Rebecca says, that's, you know, I say unfortunately because sometimes it's not pleasant. You know, but that's the reality. Uh, and just accept that. Accept that and learn to bring it back and bring it back and do it kindly and lovingly and acceptingly. Uh, and that's, that's what's going to pay off uh, in the long run. It's not a problem when the mind wanders. So when we think it's a problem, that it becomes a problem. So yeah, it's normal for the mind to, for there to be thoughts, wanders, and you are alive. So good, congratulations. <laughs> so, okay, that's thought arising, no problem. And also when the thought arising, it doesn't mean that it has to take us completely away from the method, right? So like David was talking about, you hear the method, you feel the thought arising drawing you away, but you can maintain this awareness that this is happening and say, no, thank you, come back here. And so that is the practice, the practice doing that. Yeah, thank you. Something kind of related to that, it's just a common question, maybe nobody has it, but maybe somebody does. Uh, that is uh, music. Very often we get the question, oh, you know, I find if I play some gentle, peaceful music while I'm meditating that that helps. That it helps me calm and quiet and focus my mind. Say, don't play the music, you know, because you're not, well, nowadays, a lot of people do take their music almost everywhere they go. But it's not going to be everywhere, you know. Uh, you really want to develop that capacity for calmness and focus and clarity all on your own, not relying on anything. That way there's ultimately no condition where it's not available to you. You're never missing something you need. You don't, don't want any crutch outside of yourself uh, when you develop this skill ultimately. Also, the music makes it difficult for you to hear your mind. Maybe that's why you want to play the music. But actually, if you remember, the purpose of the practice here is to cultivate this clarity so that you know clearly what is arising in your mind, then you find there is no reason for you to be playing the music that drown that out and make it more difficult to do. That's why we meditate in a place that's quiet. How would you like us blaring music at you while you're meditating? I can't hear my thought. Actually, sometimes it's so loud in some places, you really can't hear your own thoughts. So yes, you, the point is to be able to see your thoughts. Hear yourself complaining or criticizing yourself. The real sound voice that's plain, 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 plain. And it plays so much, you don't hear it until you're able to quiet down. You hear it plain non-stop. Oh, you discover something. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Like, I wasn't making it up. Like, it's powerful. Like, that, the, the torrents of habits is powerful. Also, it's possible that when we are um, when we when we are meditating and there are moments, of, okay, well, like I'm getting a new method, and we sort of become like, oh, like I'm doing well, like I'm like you, I am like some one and two, and we we'll begin to like without even knowing that we begin. To, oh, I think I'm getting somewhere. Just this this thought is actually taking us away from the method itself. So, like when we are meditating. Um, when the meditation is going well, because the bodily and mental conditions um, uh, 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 are there, okay. Um, but 
notice our tendency to get a little bit too excited. So when we get excited, oh, like you, this is this is going well. We are just like you know really do, do well for the rest of the retreat. Oh, that's when all your thoughts come because without knowing, you're already off the mat bed by getting a little carried away from it. So um, it's a very very common. Uh, she's like, when we try so hard to work on the method and oh it's working so we get excited so that actually is a valuable experience i hope you keep in mind so oh okay next time you can be on, on the method and you feel yourself wanting to get excited and, oh okay yes just the method just the method just come back to the method so even when the thoughts come you won't feel the, oh like you know they're coming back to punish me or whatever. It's like, oh, okay, thought, no problem. Thought, no problem. And then you will find your, you find the mind stabilizing more and more. The stability I'm talking about is not that it just doesn't move. That's not what we're talking about. It's that steady method, method, off method, come back to method, come back to method. That's the stability we're talking about here. So it's not that the mind is stuck in some place. That's, the, that's not what we mean by stability. No problem. It's okay. No problem. It's okay too. Oh, the mind is calm. That's okay too. That's good too. So not overexcited and not beating down on ourselves. And that's what we usually do in our daily life. Things going well. We're so happy, so excited. We're fantasizing. Five years down, oh, like if I'm doing this, like I'm gonna be enlightened next week, you know. You, <laughs> you already more off your method. So excited, and then we beat ourselves up when it seems to not be going, not working, ah uh, well. But doesn't whichever way, just coming back to method, just coming back to the method. That's all. Only one thing to do. There's only one thing to do. Come back to the method. Nothing else. Actually, just one last thing. Your attitude about it is very good. It's interesting. It's interesting. Right? I mean, obviously, at the time, it was probably a little uncomfortable as well. But to see it as interesting, fascinating. Oh my gosh! Check out what's going on in there. What you know? What an amazing set of processes. All kinds of things coming up one thing after the other, and then the patterns, right? After this, this seems to come up. And after that, this, it comes up again. You know, ah, oh, wow, it's crazy, <laughs> right? I mean, absolutely fascinating. But just to have that almost academic interest in it uh, without getting too caught up in it, it's the right attitude. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. Not take it personally. Yeah. Okay. Ready? <clears throat> Sure, that's uh, yeah. Um, How late do you want to stay? <laughs> <laughs> Big grief. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, for me, I actually started practicing uh, in college. So, you know, college was very stressful. Well, I mean, I was very anxious and uptight and stressed out anyway. And so, college, I just laid all that on top of going to university. Uh, and, and I was honestly quite miserable. Right in my own head, uh, and so, so I finally was like, I've got to look for something, you know, that's going to help me with this. And I tried all kinds of other stuff. Let me tell you, <laughs> and that really had it worked in the end. Uh, and so, so you know, I wanted to find some spiritual path, you know, something. And me just said, well, maybe that's going to do it. And so, um, so I, you know, I grew up in Kansas. And First thing to think is, well, let me see if Christianity's got something for me. And, uh, and, and I actually found a, a set of books called the Philokalia, which is a set of Greek Orthodox texts. Uh, and there's some amazing mystical writings right, in those texts that, that really hit, hit me uh, in a way that I felt was very positive. But when I reflected on, gee, you know, where am I going to find a, a real mystic Christian in Manhattan, Kansas? <laughs> you know, and I knew some people who went to churches there, and I was like, no, I don't think that's really what I'm looking for. Um, and so then I started reading yogic texts that 
Hindu uh, Vedic kind of yogic text. And that was very interesting too. And there was a lot of appeal to that. Uh, but again, I just didn't see it happening for me there where I was. And not that I was going to find Buddhism there, but, uh, but I picked up a, a book uh, on Buddhism. And I can't remember which one was first. It was one by Thich Nhat Hanh or by Joko Beck. And both of those teachers are just so straightforward. And it's right here in the simple everyday life. That's where you find it. And that just blew me away. And it, it, to me, it felt like home. Like, wow, that's it. That's it. Nothing out there, crazy, special, da da da. It's just, it's here. I've got to find it here. And it made sense. And fortunately, I went and did an internship uh, the next summer in Chicago and started going to the Zen Buddhist Temple of Chicago. Uh, and the Roshi there was really very kind and gave me a lot of attention because I was just there for three months. And, and that, that anchored me in. And so wherever I went, I found that practice again. And for me, it really, uh, it, it took some time. You know, I really was a mess in myself. And, uh, and it took a number of years before, I mean, you know, it helped, but it took a number of years for me before I would say there was a significant transformation where suddenly there was a, what was it, a significant space in, inside of myself where I didn't have to follow every train of thought that came up into my head or be upset about the train of thought that came up in my head or react to the environment around me when it was not the way I wanted it to be. Um, and, uh, but, but it works its, it works its, um, its process. And, uh, uh, and then, you know, things started to change. You know, a lot of people talked about during the communication exercise how you see how other people suffer some of the same sufferings as us and struggle the same struggles. Uh, I remember that was one thing when I was in, uh, actually in grad school in California. There was this moment where, you know, it's not that I started thinking about that all the time, but the practice was working that in me. And one time, this person who I usually found so annoying, I worked, she worked in our lab, and she was so negative about everything, and it could just really grate on you. And one day I went in, and she started going on about how horrible this was, and that was, and this was. And instead of being irritated, like I had every time before, and just kind of wanted to get away and go in and do my own thing somewhere else, it's just like, oh my gosh, it was, this person's suffering so much, and that, you know, and, and I suffer, I get like that too, you know, and it completely changed my outlook about that person and then that just started spreading out through, through my interactions with other people. And, uh, you know, it's not to say I don't get irritated. <laughs> it happens. Uh, ask her. <laughs> but, but so much less, you know, and uh, um, so, you know, these, these things just take time. Another kind of example that was really meaningful for me early on was, was anxiety. I had to do a lot of public speaking right, once I got to grad school. And I was so nervous. I mean, painfully nervous about getting up in front of a group and speaking. And through the practice, this whole idea of, hey, just because the ideas are there doesn't mean that has to control you. And so I get up and I would start talking and I would be extremely nervous and I would see it and accept it and feel it and be nervous, but I also knew how to focus my attention on the task, which was to keep delivering the talk that I had practiced and knew well, even though I'm nervous. And for, at first, I would just give the whole talk completely nervous. I was like, wow, but I could actually give the talk without shaking and quaking and stopping. I could just give it and feel nervous. And after a while, you know, just moving that attention to the task and leaving it there, even though other things may be happening, eventually it just kind of fades away. You know? I mean, I teach classes. I'm also a professor. And I go into class and some days I go in and I can feel those nerves. It's just, just what I have in me. And feel those nerves and I just smile and say, okay, I guess I'm going to start out a little nervous, you know? And I just get teaching and I just keep going and I just focus my attention on doing what I do and next thing you know, it's, it's, it's gone, you know? And some days it's not there. You know? Some days I feel it a little before I go in. And, uh, just recognize it and don't... That's just not where you put your attention. It's not where, uh, where you go with it. And 
It takes time. It takes time. And it takes patience. And it takes, to be honest, some faith. Some faith in the method. And some faith in yourself. And, uh, but it does work. Was my dad. <laughs> was that, is that enough? Is that enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, oh, I got into practice because I met David. Because uh, <laughs> I want him to like me now. <laughs> Actually, I want to bring this up because people always usually assume that I made him a Buddhist. Actually, it's the other way around. And so always people are like, <laughs> and uh, yes, he was a uh, practicing Buddhist. When I met him, and I uh, and I encounter uh, the practice uh, through David, actually, so he's my um, most important bodhisattva, and um, and it's a uh, I think also is is meeting uh, him who was practicing with a teacher who uh, was one of Master Shunyan's disciples, but also it's a time when I was. Um, suffering so much for unknown reason this i'm a typical case of like there is really nothing wrong with my life and but i'm just very depressed for unknown reason which made it even more pathetic uh and so uh so i was like okay and i was just sort of like dwelling on things that uh, that then just made me feel very very unhappy and not uh, but that's the reason why uh the teaching of suffering and how we cause our suffering spoke to me so much. It's like, this made so much more sense. It's like, this is what I was doing to myself. There was really, you know, nothing really wrong with my life, but I made it so miserable. How pathetic. And, um, and so that's why uh, when I started uh, reading Master Shunyan's book, going to the meditation group, um, I, that's just like, wow, like, I always thought in this way the Dharma saved my life. I always felt like, because uh, I, I was so depressed, I was thinking about you know killing myself and that kind of stuff, and so never acting on it in any way. But um, so I really um, have a lot of gratitude for the Dharma and the practice. And the very first retreat I attended, like I mentioned, is a seven-day intensive retreat, and um, I didn't have a lot of difficulty in terms of being able to stay in the retreat, but yeah, I, you know, I had pain and all that stuff. And, um, but the most important thing is that I learned like all I need to do is to just stick with it, stay with the method, come try and find my way to come back to the method. It doesn't matter how painful the legs are, how tired, because we were getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning. Now I flew from California, that's 1 a.m. That's where usually when I went to bed, that's when we had to wake up. So you can imagine how drowsy I was. And uh, it's literally just so drowsy, you just kind of like fall over. And so I had a lot of practice with drowsiness and I come to realization that it's just a sensation. And uh, so, but like that was a very, I, the, for me the most important valuable meditation experience for me was in this very, very drowsy state, I find my way back to the method. And when I was able to do that, I had I gained so much confidence in my ability to practice. I said, like, well, if I can find my way back to the method, uh, almost asleep, you know, I have to be able to do it every other time, if I remember to. And uh, that was very, very important for me. And it was also um, very fortunate that um, I studied with um, with with teacher in California and also um, with Master Shunyan, who um, did not emphasize these um, fantastic meditative experiences, but more practice, how to practice. Um, so, for me, um, very nice meditations. You know, they're a nice experience to have um, to remind us that you know what, if I remember to stay on the method, yeah, the meditation works but they are not really experiences to dwell on and attach to um, and, and want to recreate and relive. Um, and a lot of people have that um, problem. They had a good meditation experience and they spend years, maybe decades after that, trying to recreate that. And, uh, and that's a shame. Um, 
because they did not understand what the practice is for. So, um, but after a while, in the, uh, I, pra I practiced, come to retreat, and I uh, started translating for the Master Shin. And so I had to go to a lot of retreat because I translate in a retreat, and that was really um, um, fortunate, uh, precious opportunity. And I find, and then the, I find my practice sort of like I didn't quite know how to practice, how to go forward. It was like, so as we carry on, we find some point that we get stuck. And, uh, and that was really because I did not um, uh, get the right guidance um, that I, I should have. And, uh, but I was very fortunate to have met um, John Crook. David was talking about a, a teacher who who was one who was Master Shin's first European Dharma heir? He was he was Master Shin's first lay lay Dharma heir, uh, and he was the person who created the Western Zen retreat. And it's an extremely powerful practice. Um, it the main way it works is that it's very easy for us when we only engage in silent meditation if we don't really know how to do it properly. It's easy for us to just sit here and we kind of not really know what's going on in our mind. And when we don't know what's in our mind, then all the habitual thought patterns, all the vexation just stays there. It doesn't matter. You can meditate for a million more years. That wouldn't, that wouldn't go away. So the Western Zen retreat is extremely powerful in forcing you to look at your mind. The exercise you did this afternoon in the uh, communication exercise, it's a meditation. You might think it was a conversation. It was a meditation. When you were asked a question and share what arises in your mind, you are vocalizing the thought that arises in your mind for yourself to hear. There's absolutely no escaping from that. You're forced to look at your mind. For your association, whatever arises, you share it. You hear what you say. That's what you arise in your mind. Wow. That is an excellent method to really come to truly know our habits, our thought patterns, many of which are very destructive. So, um, though I always tell people uh, the Western Zen retreat transformed my practice, and uh, so I practice. I practice with that when I as I continue practicing with Master Shenyin's retreats. Um, so, um, and it gave me a completely different understanding of what the practice was about. And so, uh, because of that, I um, I was asked to. Uh, train with a teacher um, to learn how to run Western Zen retreat, and uh, so in this process of um, learning um, to share the Dharma, I also find it um, a very useful experience in itself. Uh, to, um, this is a very important aspect of the Ma of um, Mahayana Buddhism mm -hmm. that we're not just practicing for ourselves. When we practice, um, like I said earlier, some people, when they practice for, us, for themselves, then they started to go into practice to sit down to look for that pleasant, calm, relaxing sensation. And it's not going to sustain you long because of, um, that's, your, that's what you're looking for. And like I said, after a while, you find other ways to get that pleasant sensation. But if we bring up the bodhisattva mind, that, yeah, I'm here to practice so that I can understand the practice, I can be a better person so that I'm an easier person to live with. You are um, thinking about how you can bring positive impact to others. And um, Master Zhenning, when in the retreat, he would always tell us, you know, even when you are having a hard time sitting, Right? You have a lot of pain or something, you know, you can still keep sitting um, still 
because this will help all your neighbors. Because when they know, when they thought you're sitting well, it encourages them to sit well. Think about that. Like even though you you know kind of having a lot of pains, like but you still think about how about let me think about what I can do so that other can benefit. And guess what? When we prioritize figuring out how we can help other benefits, we stay with the method. And guess what? A few moments later, okay, like I'm sitting better now, and so we ultimately benefit. And that's how the bodhisattva path works. And so here, for example, we um, we all volunteer teachers, and so we offer our time, and we never think that oh, like I'm here, you know, like giving our time, to, like I'm here um, practicing with you, and the person who benefit the most from this is myself. So, and uh, it is a very happy way to live, and I invite you to try it. When we only think about what am I going to get this, like people will ask, what am I going to get in meditation? What is it going to do for me? Then, um, well, you know, you can start there. But like, if you stay there, um, you 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 get stuck in that small small place. Like, like okay, some people come and tell like, yeah, I want to, you know, I want to be a better person so that I can be a better husband for my wife. Now that is bodhisattva <laughs> path. <laughs> That is bodhisattva path. Yeah. And so when you are, you know, trying to be a easy, less, um, you know, irritable person, you know, so that you, that's a kindness and compassion to people around you. And when you become less irritated, you are, you are better. You feel better yourself. You're the first person to benefit. So for me, that's a very important part of the practice here. In the Dharma Drum tradition, the emphasis on not just um, engaging in the practice for ourselves, but how we can offer ourselves in the way we can. And uh, when we do that, we will be able to also motivate it to be better in our practice. So, well, how will I be uh, able to lead a retreat if I don't practice better? <laughs> so, I'm the first person who benefits. So that's been my experience. Yeah. And you know what? We are coming to a close of the Q and A. Any burning questions?